Hi everybody, we're here ready for perception. Up to this point we've been talking about uh, sensation, which are all those biological processes like vision and hearing, taste, touch, smell. Now we're going to be focusing on perception. So how does our brain perceive what, it, what we see and what is going on in the world around us? So we're going to start off by looking at something called inattentional and change blindness. So inattentional and change blindness is where sometimes we don't always see what's going on around us because we're too focused on looking at other things. So the definition of inattentional blindness is failing to see vis visible objects when our attention is turned elsewhere. And what you can see in this picture right here, you might notice this guy right here and he looks a little bit strange, uh, a gorilla in the middle of this picture. This is a very famous experiment called the Invisible Gorilla Experiment, where some people in the screen will be doing some sort of action, like throwing a ball or something like that. And a gorilla will actually walk through the middle of the screen and then uh, walk out. Well, while that's going on, because you're so focused on the people throwing the ball, that you fail to see this gorilla that's just walked through. We'll actually watch some things in class um, not quite the same thing, that, but will give you a similar feeling. Down here, we have change blindness, and this is a form of inattentional blindness, where things change in people's environments, and they don't realize that things have been changed. Um, what you see down here in this picture, I think this was also in your book, is where a man might be asking another person for instructions. Two people walk by, and they actually change out the person who the man was talking to. And sometimes you won't even notice that you're talking to a completely different person. Again, we'll watch something in class where this happens. It's not saying that people are dumb or any less intelligent. It's just because our brain doesn't expect things to change, we don't see them change. This is just giving you an overview of some of the perceptual illusions that we'll talk about um, throughout this lecture. At the top here you have what's called the mueller liar illusion, where one line looks to be shorter than the other, even though if you were to measure from A to B or from B to C, you would find out that the lengths are exactly the same. This illusion here is looking at um, the height versus the width. When we look at this, we perceive that the St. Louis Arch is actually taller than it is wide, but in reality, the height is the same as the width. And last down here, this is demonstrating something called the Ames Room, where depending on where the people are standing, they appear to change size, even though they actually don't. All of these examples here are examples of visual capture, that vision takes precedence over any of our other senses. One other example of this was the McGurk effect where we watched that video and we were watching him move his mouth and it looked like he was saying um, fa instead of ba even though um, he was saying ba the whole time. When we saw his mouth change we perceived a different sound. So that would be visual capture. One of the main ideas of perception is this idea of Gestalt. So Gestalt wasn't just one person. Gestalt was actually, it actually refers to a group of German psychologists. And what they thought was they were trying to look for how does the brain organize all of these little bits of sensory information into an organized whole. So how are we able to do this and actually make sense of what's going on in the world around us? So what they found is that because, and you've probably heard this cliche, the whole is greater than the parts, our brain is constantly filtering all of this sensory information around us and inferring perceptions in, of what we see or what we hear in ways that make sense to us. So imagine if all we saw were these little tiny pieces of information and our brain didn't put them all together for us, our world would be a very confusing place. Two of the things that they use to help to explain how our brain does this, how is it able to bring about 
bring together all of the sensory information are two things that we've already talked about and that's bottom up processing which is looking at all of these small pieces and then realizing hey I see eyes I see a nose I see a mouth this must be a face and also looking at top-down processing where we construct our perceptions based on our previous experiences and we talked before about how top-down processing although it's a little bit faster sometimes it's more prone to error so now we're going to get into some of these specific things about um, form perception uh, one of the things that you've probably seen before although you weren't maybe aware of what it was called is this idea of figure ground and this is a way of organizing our visual field into objects that stand out from their surroundings so if you look at this picture right here you might see one of two things some of you might see the white portion first you might say oh that's a vase or a candlestick for you this vase is we're using these figure ground this is the figure then all of the surroundings which means this black areas here would be what's called the ground okay so again if you see the white first the white is the figure the black is what's known as the ground or the background others of you might notice the black first and you might say oh well I see two faces there's the nose the mouth the eyes and the same on this side, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And you might say, well, I see those first. Well, for you, the black part here is the figure, and the white part here is just the background. That means everything else. Okay? The same thing here. What stands out first to most people are these white birds, white swans. So these would be the figure. And then everything else, like the black here and the gray, these would be the ground or the background. Okay, It is possible to also see it the other way around where you see blackbirds and everything else becomes ground. So in that case the blackbirds would be your figure. Grouping. Grouping is our perceptual tendency to organize stimuli into groups. We like seeing things instead of each individual piece. It's easier for us to perceive if we put them all together. So there's different ways that we do this. So one way we do this is through proximity. If you look at this area right here, okay, we'll see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six different lines. But when we look at this, you might see it as there's a pair of lines there's a pair of lines and there's a pair of lines because these two are closer than these here this one and this one we might perceive them as being in pairs just because of their proximity their closeness to each other this one here similarity what we have here are six triangles and three circles but how you might see it as oh there's one group of triangles, there's a group of circles, and there's a group of triangles. Or some of you might see it as going this way. We have three rows of triangle, circle, triangle, triangle, circle, triangle, triangle, circle, triangle. Because they're similar, we group them together. Continuity. We have two things going on that our brain perceives in this picture here. We have a straight line and we have a wavy line. So what our brain perceives though, think about why doesn't it think of as these little segments or little half circles that just happen to be together. Instead, to make it continuous for us, we think of one line and one wavy line. Connectedness. Okay. When you look at these circles and lines here, one way that we might look at it is here's a circle, there's a line, there's a circle, there's another circle, there's a line, there's another circle. But for most of us, we don't see it that way. We see it as that's one item, there's another item, and there's a third item. Because they're connected, we see these each as 
one piece instead of individual items like what we see right here. The last one here that's going to be demonstrated by these um, shapes down at the bottom here is called closure. When you first look at the figure on the left that I've just circled, what do you notice at first? Focusing on the center section. Take a second and, and look at this. So what you might see, what you might have perceived, is something like this. A triangle in the middle. And the reason why that happens, if you did, is if you notice right here, notice that they're not closed off. Okay? And because they're not closed off, your brain wants to close them. So we see a triangle there. If you look at this figure on the right, it's not as easy for you to perceive that triangle because these are closed. Now we're going to get into um, some binocular clues, cues, excuse me. Binocular cues means we need both eyes, or by means two, we need both of our eyes to see these different cues. One of the things that we need cues about is depth perception. So in order for us to see objects in three dimensions, okay, we need to have some sort of depth perception, and this is a binocular cue. Okay? One of the tests of depth perception that they use particularly with small babies is this idea of the visual cliff. Now if you just look at this picture here at the top, you might look at this and go, oh my goodness, that baby's going to fall over into nothing. But don't worry, this area right here is plexiglass, so baby is perfectly safe. But what they're testing here is babies are still developing their um, binocular cues, this idea of depth perception. So what a baby does is when they get to, um, before they get to a certain age, they don't realize that things are in three dimensions. So if you look down in this bottom picture, see how the floor down here has the same checkers as what it does on the top? What young babies will do is they will crawl across this plexiglass to their mom or to someone else with no problem because they don't realize that the floor down here is actually a drop that it's down below them. They think that this floor is actually a straight shot across. As babies get older and they develop depth perception, they'll no longer crawl across. They'll go like this guy right here and just sit and wait because they know if I try to crawl over this, I'm going to fall down. So they stop. So binocular clues, cues, keep mispronouncing this, are depth cues. Okay? Two of them are also called uh, retinal disparity and convergence. And again, they're depending on two eyes. Okay? So retinal disparity is our cue for perceiving depth. So what has to happen is our brain is comparing what vision signals are coming in from each of our eyes. And using the information from each of our retinas, hence retinal disparity, each of our eyes, the brain can actually compute distance. The greater the disparity between our two eyes, the closer we know the object is. In your book, if you um, look on page 246, they have the floating finger sausage test. I would recommend you do that because it's kind of weird. Looks literally like your fingers are chopped in half and floating in front of you. And that's because of retinal disparity and your eyes and your brain trying to judge distance. Convergence is another binocular cue for perceiving depth. Convergence, think of things converging is, converging is the, them coming together. So think about if you take your fingers and you put them, put a finger at the tip of your nose. Now try to look at the tip of your nose. As your eyes come in or converge inward, okay, 
that's convergence. The greater your eyes have to strain inward, that tells your brain this object is really close. Like, hey, my finger is right at the tip of my nose. Sorry, no activity, because you're doing this at home. So we're going to move on to monocular cues.